This is the story of the creepy cat. Don't turn out the lights. It all started one rainy night when Catherine heard a scratching at her window. She peeked out to see a cold gray cat with yellow eyes sitting on her second story window pane. How'd you get all the way up here? She thought as she opened the window and took the cat in her arms. As she dried the cat, she noticed a collar that said, Ashes. Ashes, where's your owner? Catherine asked. The cat just looks back at her, almost like it was smiling. Catherine's mom and dad agreed to let her keep the cat until they found its owner. You can stay in my room as long as you're not afraid of bears, Catherine laughed. She pointed to her beloved old teddy bear, Gus. Ashes just stares at Gus. That night, Catherine fell asleep to the sounds of the rain and ashes purring. But when she wakes up the next morning, Gus wasn't there. He isn't on the floor. He isn't under the covers. Ashes, do you know what happened to Gus? Ashes just looks at her, almost like he was smiling. Everyone quickly warmed up to Ashes. He was quiet and calm. He spent most of his time just sitting in the hallway, staring up at the pictures of Catherine and her family. The only one who didn't like him was the old family dog, Sadie. Sadie was normally friendly with everyone, but every time Ashes came near her, she let out a low growl. One evening, while Catherine was scouring her room for Gus, she heard a great commotion. She rushed downstairs to see Sadie barking at Ashes, who was on top of a cupboard with a long, thin scratch across his face almost too thin for Sadie's big paws, but Ashes couldn't have given that to himself. Sadie was banished to her doghouse for the rest of the cold, rainy night. Sometime after midnight, Catherine wakes up to a scritch scratching coming from outside her door. She looks for Ashes, but he's not in her room. She walked out into the hallway where all the pictures of her and her family had their faces scratched out. Ashes, did you do this? She whimpered, but there was no response. She made her way downstairs to see ashes by the fireplace. It looked like he was on fire. Catherine rushed over, but when she got to him, she saw he wasn't on fire. But in his mouth, burning bright, was beloved teddy bear Gus. Catherine let out a gasp. Ashes slowly approached her. As he did, she noticed his shadow was becoming bigger and bigger. Too big for such a little cat. Ashes got closer and closer, leaving burning sparks in his wake. Catherine was too scared to even scream. Closer and closer. All of a sudden, there was a giant bang, an in-charge Sadie barking and snarling. With a wail, Ashes dropped Gus and jumped through the window, running off into the night. Catherine quickly put out the fire. Ashes never returned. The next day, Catherine searched online for Ash's missing cat, but nothing showed up. Then, on a whim, she looks up all the unexplained fires in our town. There are pictures from many over the years, and somewhere in each picture amidst the rubble, there is always a little coal gray cat that almost looks like it's smiling. This is the story of the winter break nightmare. Don't turn out the lights. It was the first day of winter break at Thurman's boarding school, and the students all gathered in the food hall to wait for their parents to pick them up, ready to go home for two whole weeks. Two sisters, Francesca and Catherine, sat at a long table with all their friends. Even though they had their thick jackets on, they were still cold, but they were also buzzing with excitement to see their mom and dad for the first time in three months and go home to their cozy, warm house until the headmistress, Mrs. Thurman, walked up to their table. Francesca, Catherine, I'm sorry, but your parents just called. They won't be coming to pick you up for winter break. You'll be staying here. What? exclaimed Francesca. Can we at least talk to our parents? We haven't been able to get a hold of them since they called. Suddenly, a loud crackle rang out through the food hall. It was so loud that the girls and their friends all jumped a little in surprise. Oh, that's just the groundskeeper, said Mrs. Thurman, putting a reassuring but unfamiliar hand on Francesca and Catherine's shoulders. That night, Francesca and Catherine laid in their small beds on opposite sides of their large bare room. No matter how many blankets they put on, they couldn't get warm. Then another crackle. 
louder than before. I have to find out what this is, Francesca cried as she leapt out of bed. But we aren't allowed to leave our room after quiet hours, warned Catherine. It was too late. Francesca was already out the door. She walked down the long hallway. She followed the sounds down into a wing of the school she had never been in before. The sounds led her to a large wooden door marked basement. She tried the knob, but it wouldn't turn. Francesca threw her tiny weight against the door, but it wouldn't budge. Then suddenly, Mrs. Thurman appeared. You know you aren't allowed to be out of bed after curfew. I'm sorry, I just... It's okay. Just don't let me catch you down here again. Ever. Mrs. Thurman said, her voice stern in a way Francesca had never heard before. The next morning, Francesca and Catherine sat in the food hall again. This time, they were all alone. All the other kids had already gone home. The sisters ate their cold cereal, missing the warm, hot chocolate their parents always made this time of year. Please don't go down there again, urged Catherine. What if you get in trouble? Then I'll be all by myself. But Francesca didn't even hear her sister. She couldn't stop remembering how solid the basement door felt. How would she ever get it open, even if she did make it back to the door without getting caught? Another loud crackle interrupted the silence. Then a muffled yell. Then a crash. The crash was so violent it shook the table. It's getting louder, admitted Catherine. Francesca ran her hands down the table, trying to find the source of the shaking. It was coming from the floor. She crawled under the table and pressed her hands against the thick rug. The floor gave a little underneath her. Francesca pushed down even harder, and the floor dipped even more. The floor didn't feel like floor at all. She ripped up the rug. Underneath was a trap door. Francesca flung open the trap door, and suddenly, she was staring straight down into the basement. She saw rows and rows of frozen grown-ups. In the front were her mom and dad. Francesca stared in disbelief. She was too late. Her mom was completely frozen, and her dad was too, except for the fingers on his right hand. When her dad saw her, the corners of his mouth turned up just a little, a shard of ice falling off his lips as they moved. Then her dad's fingers froze over completely, making a familiar loud crackling sound. Francesca screamed and fell backwards. She looked up. Mrs. Thurman? Mrs. Thurman looked down at Francesca. You can call me mother now. This is the story of the petrifying pool party. Don't turn out the lights. It was a hot summer day. So hot, it almost felt like everything was moving in slow motion. Justin, his parents, and his four brothers sipped cold lemonade as they all played cards. Then suddenly, Justin's phone dinged. It was a text from a number he didn't know. The text read, Hey, it's Mark. I'm having a pool party tomorrow. You should come. Mark was a year older than Justin and the coolest kid in his grade. Mark was also an only child, so his parents let him throw the best pool parties. Justin had never been to a pool party before. He couldn't wait. The next day, Justin's mom handed him the swim bag she had carefully packed. Just be careful. Mark lives all the way at the top of the hill. They're a little weird up there, his mom warned. Justin began walking up the big hill to Mark's house. Is the top of the hill really that different from the bottom, he thought. Finally, he was at Mark's house. It was very quiet. I'm so glad to see you, Mark exclaimed. Something in the pit of Justin's stomach got tight. Justin had never talked to Mark at school. Why is Mark so glad to see him, he thought. But then, the shimmering blue pool caught Justin's eye, and he forgot all about that feeling in his stomach. Do you want a snow cone? They're cherry, Mark asked invitingly. That's my favorite flavor, Justin said, and he excitedly took the snow cone. Red cherry ice ran down his face as Justin took his first bite. Mom's right, he thought. The top of the hill is different, and Justin liked it. He took another, even bigger bite. Suddenly, the whole world got foggy and all Justin could think about was the pain in his head. Must have been a brain freeze. Justin ran towards the pool and did a big cannonball into the water. When he finally came to the surface, his head was still throbbing. Looking around the party for the first time, Justin realized he didn't see any other kids. Where was everyone? Mark was the coolest kid in school. Where is everybody? Justin asked politely. Oh, everyone is coming later. Casually replied Mark, 
before doing his own cannonball to the pool. Mark popped up from under the water. It's so cool you have so many brothers. I've always wanted a brother, said Mark. Mark and Justin played in the pool for hours. But every time Justin got out of the pool for another snow cone, the whole backyard was still empty. In fact, he didn't even hear the doorbell ring once. Did Mark invite anyone else? As the sun started to go down, Justin smelled a barbecue. He remembered it was dinner time back at the bottom of the hill. I should be home for dinner, Justin yelled to Mark. You have so many brothers. Your parents probably wouldn't even notice if you were a little late, Mark replied. They would definitely notice, Justin laughed, still walking towards the gate. It's not fair you have four brothers and I never even got one, Mark called after him calmly. Justin laughed awkwardly and let himself out of the gate, leaving Mark's big house and pool behind. But which direction was his own house? Justin looked around hoping something would give him a clue, but all the perfectly manicured green lawns looked the same. Justin couldn't get himself to focus on anything but his memories of the bright blue glow of the pool, the sound of splashing, and the taste of bright red cherry snow cone. Justin thought Mark's parents could help him find his way home, so he led himself back into the backyard. I can't remember which way I live, Justin said. What do you mean? You live here, Mark stated matter-of-factly. What are you talking about? I need your parents to help me get home, Justin replied. My parents? You mean our parents? You're my little brother, Mark asserted. That wasn't true. Mark was an only child, right? Justin clutched the fluffy towel his mom had packed him. Justin remembered the towel. He remembered the swim bag he carried all the way up the hill, but he couldn't remember his house at all now. Mark tried to give Justin a reassuring hug, but Justin squirmed in Mark's arms, knocking something out of Mark's pocket. Mark leapt to grab it. Justin got there first. It was a little glass vial. The label read, Warning, Memory Loss Potion. The bright red liquid inside smelled just like cherry. Why would you do this? pleaded Justin. Come on, mom's barbecuing tonight, said Mark, leading Justin into the house. Justin walked. He tried to remember his dad and his brothers. He couldn't picture them at all now. Justin tried to remember his mom, but he couldn't picture her face either. He looked down at the towel she had packed him. It didn't feel familiar anymore. Maybe Mark was right? Maybe this is where he lived all along. I'm so glad to have a little brother, whispered Mark. I always wanted one. This is the story of Grandpa's visit. Don't turn out the lights. It was time for bed, and after Emily's mom said goodnight, she told Emily that her grandpa might stop by. Emily said goodnight and quickly fell asleep. A little while later, Emily woke up when she heard footsteps in the hallway that stopped at her door. She looked over and saw a shadow of someone's feet. Hello, she said, but no one answered. Emily thought it was strange that the person just walked away, but she tried to put it out of her mind and she rolled over and went back to sleep. But later in the night, she was woken up again by the footsteps in the hall. By this time, she was starting to get nervous. She tried to calm herself down and tell herself that it was probably just her mom. She called out again, Hello? But no one responded. Hello? She yelled in desperation. The door slowly creaked open. Someone was standing there. They stepped into the room, but it was too dark to tell who it was. Finally, Emily could see that it was her grandpa. He smiled, and Emily sighed a big sigh of relief. I wanted to come visit you before I have to leave, her grandpa said. Emily said she was so glad he did. I want you to have this, grandpa said, and he handed Emily an old photo. Thank you, grandpa. You and grandma look so happy. It's late now. I have to go, grandpa said. Emily happily fell back fast asleep. The next morning, Emily's mom came into her room. Emily, your grandpa... Oh, look what he gave me! Where did you get that? Emily's mom asked, her voice shaking with fear. When grandpa was here last night, he came in and said goodbye. 
For a moment, Emily's mom couldn't speak. Finally, she said, Your grandpa didn't come over. He passed away suddenly last night. In this picture, Emily's mom said, We buried this picture with grandma when she passed away last year. It was the only copy we had. This is the story of the abandoned schoolyard. Don't turn out the lights. Liam always loved the week he spent at his grandparents' house every summer. He was allowed to wander and explore anywhere he wanted, except the abandoned schoolyard on the other side of the creek. It's just not safe, Gramps would tell him. Liam didn't really want to go to the school anyway because there was a creepy old mural on the side of the school and it kind of freaked Liam out. There were plenty of other places to explore. But there weren't any other kids his age to play with in the whole town, and Liam started to feel lonely. So it came as a shock when one day, he heard a group of kids laughing and playing outside. He rushed out to see a whole group of children his own age playing at the abandoned schoolyard. When the other kids spotted Liam, they smiled wide, almost too wide. Hey, come join us! We have room for another, be our friend. The kids all started to chant. Be our friend, be our friend, be our friend. Liam knew that his grandfather didn't want him to go to the old schoolyard, but he was so excited to finally have someone to play with. So he carefully jumped from stone to stone across the creek. As he got closer, their chant got louder and louder and their smiles got wider, and wider, and wider. And just as he was about to reach the edge of the schoolyard, a hand grabbed him from behind. Liam, what are you doing? growled his grandfather as he pulled Liam back towards the house. But why is it dangerous? Liam asked his grandparents. It just is, leave it at that, said Gramps. Then Grandma tried to distract him with some fresh chocolate chip cookies, which worked. But as the week went on, Liam got more and more bored. He had already explored everywhere worth exploring. He had heard all of Gramps' stories, and he was starting to get a stomach ache from all the cookies. Then, with one day left before he would finally be able to go home, Liam heard the kids calling to him again. Hey, there you are, called the kids. Come, be our friend. Be our friend. Be our friend. It looked like so much fun, and his grandparents were probably worrying about nothing. So Liam carefully jumped across the creek, and the other children's smiles got wider and wider. And as he got closer, he noticed that the kids all looked a lot like the kids on the old mural. Which is impossible, Liam thought. That mural is over 40 years old. But then Liam stepped onto the playground. And he and the other kids laughed and laughed and played and played. Sometimes Liam wondered how long he had been there. Minutes? Hours? Days? Years? And sometimes Liam would notice that Nero now had a new kid on it. One looked exactly like him. And then he would promise himself he would go back to his grandparents' house. After one more game.